All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Gotham Writers Inside Writing. Today, we are venturing into the wide world of comics and graphic novels. But before we get into that, a couple of announcements. First off, a reminder that the Gotham Writers Conference is a go for October 16th through 18th. It's going to be on Zoom, and registration is now open. Uh, we'll talk more about that at the end of the show. Also, if you've missed any episodes of Inside Writing up, up until this point, you can see them all on the Gotham Writers YouTube channel, as well as on all of your favorite podcast platforms. And for those of you that want to rehash the show we're about to have, that'll be available tomorrow. All right. About today, as always, you can submit your questions for the Q&A portion of the show. Uh, there's a Q&A button on the dashboard of your Zoom window. Some of you are using it already. Uh, so you can submit those questions whenever. And in the second half of the show, I'll start pulling questions from the audience to pose to our panelists. Uh, lastly, at the end of the show, stay tuned for instructions on how to participate in the Graphic Novels Twitter Pitch Party, uh, where you can pitch your own graphic novel project. Now then, enough of that. Let's talk about graphic novels and comic books We'll start with a quote, which kind of had to come from Stan Lee, who said, if Shakespeare and Michelangelo were alive today, and if they decided to collaborate on a comic, Shakespeare would write the script and Michelangelo would draw it. How could anybody say that this wouldn't be a worthwhile, as worthwhile an art form as anything on earth? All right, so let's meet our panelists now. First off, literary agent at Inkwell Management, Charlie Olson. Hello, Charlie. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. Thank you for being here. Uh, and our second panelist, acclaimed illustrator and cartoonist who has worked on such projects as Laura Dean, keeps on breaking up with me, and don't go without me, Rosemary Valera O'Connell. Hello, Rosemary. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. So mm -hmm. we're, we're going to start with the basic questions just to get them out of the way. Charlie, I want to start with you. In the simplest terms, what is a graphic novel? Oh God! Uh, a graphic no <laughs> a graphic novel is a um, it's a literary work that uses sequential storytelling to tell a story. Um, you can think of something that people might be more familiar with is a picture book that also uses sequential storytelling. You know, you read those when you're uh, you know three to three to seven years old. I mean, I know some adults who read them still. Um, <laughs> and a graphic novel does something very similar. Um, except it, there's kind of a, a, a standardized form of it, you know, using panels and uh, word balloons to convey a, a story. Um, if you think of like a prose novel as something that's um, a more traditional kind of form, a graphic novel is a mix of words and imagery to convey a feeling. Um, and th that's, that's really what it is. Gotcha. And Rosemary, anything to add to that? Any Anything about a graphic novel that he didn't mention? I mean, I would just say that it is a story told through a language that exists through the marriage of images and texts. So in a way that differs it from a storybook or say uh, an illustrated novel, comics, um, graphic novels, whatever, you know, sort of a name you want to associate with that form of storytelling is kind of its own beast. They communicate stories in a way that are as uh, unique to them and they sort of speak, uh, they speak that language that exists uh, at the intersection and that's sort of the culmination of the language and image. Mm -hmm. and, and Rosemary, you're a cartoonist as well. Is there a difference that you see between being a cartoonist and being an illustrator for a graphic novel? It's all the same to me, honestly. I, I people, uh, I think everyone has sort of their own argument or lack of argument about semantics, but I, think of myself first and foremost as a storyteller and the shape that that takes differs sometimes but at the core that is always uh, what I see my work as what I see what I'm doing as and the name that gets attached to it is I, I'm sort of indifferent to. Gotcha and, and Charlie speaking of names comic books and graphic novels is there a difference between the two? Yeah um, a comic book is just a shorter format of uh, of comics. A graphic novel is a longer format of comics. Um, when you buy a graphic novel that's been put out by um, a comics publisher, what you're typically buying is, you know, uh, if you buy an, a book from Image Comics, for example, it's 100 pages long, typically, um, and it's just five issues of comic books bound up 
into um, a graphic novel. When they're writing those comic books, they're thinking of a of a graphic novel. They're thinking in terms of a longer story divided into chunks. If you were looking at it as a graphic novel, you might think of it as chapters. So um, comic books are really just a serialized graphic novel. You brought up a lot of points that I want to get back to later on in the show, but I want to get some preliminary questions out of the way here first. So, Charlie, what are what are some things that traditional prose writers need to understand before making the jump to writing a graphic novel? Um, so writing a graphic novel is kind of like being a screenwriter. If um, a prose writer has any experience with screenwriting, working on a screenplay, um, then they have a lot of the tools that they need to write a graphic novel script. Um, you know, you have to think in terms of where the, the camera, i.e. The, the reader looking at each panel, um, is looking into the scene, what's, who's presented in the scene, um, those kind of details. But in order to not drive an artist insane, um, you have to be very economical with your words and with the detail of the, the scene. You know, I, I heard um, reportedly that uh, certain types of writers, like the Alan Moores, the legendary writers of the world, the Alan Moores, um, will say this panel has a thousand raindrops in it, or something like that, and then go and meticulously count those raindrops. You know, that that's the kind of detail that might drive an artist bananas. I think it's actually better to be a bit more um, a bit more flexible to collaboration. You know, you might conceive something, and then the artist will look at it and say, well. Maybe this shouldn't be a splash page. Maybe this should be broken into panels or let's try splitting this across a couple different pages. Um, so learning to um, collaborate with someone else who has a creative vision is important mm -hmm. um, and learning to, to kind of think differently. You, don't, you can't use as many words as you can um, in prose. It's a, it's a different kind of skill set. Um, even with dialogue, I mean, um, you can't have someone give a, a lengthy monologue um, or else the reader will get bored. Um, or it'll just crowd out all of the art on the, the page. You know, if, you, if it's all word balloon, um, what is the reader gonna see? Mm -hmm. So you brought up what I wanna switch into talking about now, which is the collaboration process, which is what I think a lot of prose writers would have to acclimate to. Mm -hmm. uh, Rosemary, as the illustrator, how do you define the role that you play in developing a comic or graphic novel? I mean, I think that the most successful collaborations between writers and cartoonists happen when both the writer and the cartoonist are fully cognizant of what their roles and what they are sort of bringing into the collaboration. I mean, artists are sort of, you know, you are providing the skeleton, but what, how the story is told, how time flows, the aesthetics of your book, the actual, like, uh, the sort of transmission of the story itself does rest in the hands of your artist. It's a visual medium. And I think some of the, the greatest collaborations um, come from artists or from writers understanding that they are working in a medium that they maybe aren't necessarily fluent in. There isn't a direct sort of like one-to-one -one translation of how good of a prose writer you are and how good of a graphic novelist or a writer of a graphic novel you are because you are having to sort of shift um, your expectation, your ability, your, uh, just the idea that you have for how a story can get told. And I think picking a, an artist, a collaborator whose vision you feel really aligns with yours is paramount because they are going to be digging their hands into this thing that you're making in order to shape it into what, uh, the sort of, a the combination of your two visions it's going to be. It's going to belong to the two of you completely. Um, I mean, one of the, I've worked with a lot of different writers, but what was so wonderful about working with Mariko is she very much handed me this sort of like complete unit of storytelling, um, but was very uh, upfront about the fact that she was like, I, I spent about six months, however long writing the script, but you are going to spend two years in this story, living in this story, working with these characters. So your, your contributions, your thoughts, how the story needs to change, um, like it's a, she let it be a sort of a living thing in my hands, which I think from what I've heard from other cartoonists um, who, who draw and write, or, but who mostly draw with other writers, that's, that's kind of the best you can ask for. That's the best that that collaboration can go, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So Rosemary, when you see the words on the page, when you first read a script, 
what happens? Do you start matching images in your head to the words or what, what's that process like for you? Um, yeah, I mean, with, uh, with Laura Dean, I, I basically, I was able to read the full script start to finish. Um, so the idea of kind of the, the story as a complete unit was there. And I remember there were scenes, uh, the last, uh, there's a sort of a, a final scene in the book, a kind of an important culmination scene that uh, the first time I read the script sort of appeared fully formed. Um, it just made sense in my head that this is what this would look like. This is how this would progress. This was how I had to lay out the page in order to get the emotional impact that was already present in the writing. Um, and I feel like when I'm reading scripts, a lot of my brain is going into that sort of problem solving um, puzzle mode of kind of like trying to take apart um, the intent of a line, the sort of desired emotional effect and figure out the best way to translate that into uh, yeah, uh, the, what the visual moments need to look like in order to sort of support and amplify that. Mm -hmm. And, and Charlie, what role do you play in this collaboration process? Do you kind of just match up the artist and writer and then move along, or do you serve like an editorial role? Um, usually in the collaboration, uh, I'll, I'll take, I mean, I've, I've got a roster of probably about 40 to 50 different writers and artists who work on comics and graphic novels. And so when a writer comes to me with an idea, um, I'll typically try to find the perfect artist for it. And we'll, um, I'll typically try and pair them up with somebody that I work with. Um, just because I know that person is re reliable um, and I've worked with them before. Um, so I do a little bit of matchmaking in that way. Um, when dealing with somebody who, is, who I don't represent, um, then I'm typically talking to the other person's agent or sometimes with the artist or, or writer themselves um, to try and figure out um, all of the nitty gritty details of what that collaboration will look like on the business side of things. Um, or you know what happens if there's a disagreement? Who has the controlling um, kind of uh, vote on something? Um, let's say that you're working on a film or TV adaptation. Who who has the controlling um, vote? And usually you'd make it the person who originated the idea, the person who started with, uh, started the process. But um, you know I, I try and I try and create a, a means of resolving. Um, conflicts that don't exist yet. Um, and that's really what the collaboration is about um, from my perspective. But then also, you know, I do love to watch um, an idea turn into something tangible. So um, I've been known to lurk on my share of, uh, my fair share of creative calls just to ab absorb some of those creative brainwaves. And, and whenever you're matching writers and artists, is there a dialogue there? You just kind of tell the artist, this is your writer, tell the writer, this is your artist, or do you? Oh, there's definitely a dialogue. So um, typically someone will say, well, here's, here's the look that I'm going for. They'll, they'll reference uh, a comp title. Um, and that's very important for the process of pitching too. We can come back to that um, you know, later on, but um, they'll, they'll say, well, I want it to feel, to have the feel of, and they'll name some book that they've read or some book that they, they admire. Um, and we'll use that as kind of a starting point for finding an artist whose style might mesh. You know, if you're gonna work with somebody, if you're gonna do a book that has robots in it, you want somebody who's good at drawing mechanical environments. If you're gonna do, um, you know, something that is um, is set, it's like a contemporary book that um, is focused on mood and maybe on the subtleties of interactions, you might want somebody who has colors um, that they can use effectively to convey a certain mood um, or little subtleties in their art that um, will, will be evocative on the page. Um, and so there are often times where I will pair somebody up and, or, you know, present an artist to an, a writer and they'll just say, I don't, I don't understand this person's art. And then we go back to the drawing board and look for, for somebody else. And it's, it's not a, you know, it's not a knock against that artist. It's just, you know, uh, they, they, they want to work with someone else. Um, so sometimes there are a couple different tries. Um, other times it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, you know, there's a, a book that I sold to HarperCollins. Um, I want to say a year ago, but I don't know what time is anymore now that I'm inside. <laughs> um, a book called, uh, well, it was called The Ghoul Ate My Homework. Now it's called The Ghoul Next Door. 
and uh, my writer Cullen Bunn had come to me and said, I really want to do a children's horror series. And I said, okay, uh, you know, like nothing too grisly, I hope. And he showed it to me and it wasn't too grisly. It was just the right amount of scary and fun. And so then I thought, okay, who can do the right amount of scary and fun? And um, I instantly thought of Kat Ferris and she said she'd love to work with him. So I introduced them and then like two weeks later, they sent me a bunch of art and I was just like, wow, this is perfect. Like you've just given me without me really having to do anything except for introduce you. You it, Clearly it's a good match because you've just run off and done something incredible. Um, you know, we worked together on the proposal to make sure it was ready to go out to publishers, but um, that, that was a really, that was a great match. Um, and so that's the ideal situation where you introduce two people and they start making music together. Mm -hmm. And, and Rosemary, do you have to love a story to want to do the art for it, or do you just kind of have to have a vision for it? I, I personally very much do. I mean, I graphic novels, when you're talking about something that's, you know, 200 pages, 300 pages, it is a labor. It is a time-intensive labor, so you will be spending a lot of time on that story, and if it isn't something that, you know, if you, if your spark for it and your drive for it can't sustain itself over like a two and a half year, three year working period, then it's, you know, it's going to be a lot more work than it is anything else. So, um, I mean, part of what was so exciting to me about getting to work with Mariko is that I loved, like, my connection to the script and to the story was so instant. And that's why it felt so, uh, like, such a privilege to be able to take on that story. Mm -hmm. And, and you keep mentioning that story. So I, I want to go into what, what makes you really enjoy working with a writer? Is there something they can do to make your job more enjoyable? I mean, for me, it's just, I, like I said, I, I identify first and foremost as a storyteller and being able to work with a writer is sort of, um, I appreciate it as an artist, just getting to sort of uh, watch another artist at work, someone who's, you know, uh, incredible at their craft, who is sort of, in uh, a league that is different than mine who can teach me things like I get to I got to learn a lot as a as a storyteller as a creator from collaborating with someone who I admire so thoroughly and whose work I feel like is so elevated um yeah did that <laughs> I lost track of the question a little no, bit that, that <laughs> definitely answered the question I was just making, <laughs> I, trying to give our, our writer a sense of what they can do to make the job for an artist easier and you, you, you definitely sure. answered that yeah, I mean, like I said, uh, Mariko, I was not the first, uh, she'd done collaborations with her cousin Jillian before, so she was sort of, she had familiarized herself with what uh, what the split of work was going to be, what the communication had to be like, um, and I think she knew uh, that being precious about sort of what she had written or what vision she had didn't serve the final product and didn't make it easier for us that it had to be the story had to be sort of a very malleable and changing thing um because the iteration that she had presented would just uh by the nature of having another person's hands on it end up different um at the end of the road mm -hmm. so charlie i'm curious when, when you're evaluating a query or a script does exceptional writing win the day or do you kind of have to know where the artistic vision is going with it? Um, you know, I think that exceptional writing is important. I, um, I recently signed up a brother-sister writing team um, who came to me out of my, um, I believe it was out of my slush pile. Um, I was just kind of trolling through there looking for, uh, looking for gems. And um, they pitched an idea for a graphic novel that has a supernatural element, and it starts off with a murder. And the, um, it starts off specifically on the very first pages with two teenage girls discussing um, the news that one of their, possibly one of their classmates, they're not really sure, was found dead and stuffed in a closet. And that's pretty, that's pretty intense. Um, and I was like, ooh, I, that's pretty intense. I don't know if that'll fly. Um, but the part that really pulled me into it was the sense of humor came across immediately in the first two pages of it because the girls were talking about how she didn't have any tags on her clothes. She didn't have any identification. Um, you know, nobody was really sure who this person was. And then one of the girls says, and she didn't have her phone on her. And then they, the, the other girl who was looking at her phone 
and just kind of tuning out her friend like looks up and she's like she didn't have her phone that's so sad <laughs> <laughs> and like that detail is something that made me go oh okay now i know what the tone of this is going to be it's going to be kind of a, a playful um a playful but also you know in a playful intense kind of horror mashup and that's that kind of voice i think would, works perfectly for ya and so that was enough for me to say i want to see more and i want to talk to you mm -hmm. um so it you know the the writing is important and they didn't have an artist at that point you know i ended up pairing them up with an artist so um, i was gonna say this gonna be my next question is if you don't have art so the writing can carry it even if you don't have art with it yeah the writing the writing can definitely carry it um you know there are graphic novels that are sold um just on script i i like to package things together just because i'm a visual person um and i think that when you present you can read the storytelling on the page in a, in a graphic novel script but when you when you actually see it when you see the work that someone like rosemary does in sample pages um the, it it's a much better sales tool you know i have to be a business guy sometimes it's a much better sales tool um than than just script um because they go oh that's the book i can read it i know exactly what i'm getting um my my dad was a business guy and he always talked about WYSIWYG. what you see is what you get you know like that kind of a that kind of a deal gotcha uh last last question about the collaboration process rosemary since it is a collaboration how much are you willing to change to meet in a writer's vision or is that not something that that happens i mean i i've been fortunate enough um and i really do think it's fortunate that most of my projects where i've collaborated with writers um i've been able to choose to work with writers whose work i'm already with already a familiar with but b also a, a fan of like someone whose vision i trust which i think is a uh, kind of the the only thing that really matters in a writer artist collaboration is there has to be a lot of mutual trust in whatever choices whatever edits whatever shifts one of you wants to take um you have to be at a point where your your i don't know creative voices are compatible enough that like if this needs to shift in this direction i you know i i trust your judgment as a creator enough to sort of follow with you um and i trust your relationship with me and your respect for me as a co-creator that like it can it will be a conversation like there will be no sort of like unilateral choices um everything is always uh it's always a team effort or it, it, in my opinion i think it should always be a uh, sort of a living breathing thing that we just keep passing forth back and forth between us and shaping together mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to switch gears a bit and talk about querying a graphic novel. So, Charlie, a, a couple questions for you here. At what point should a writer query? You, you mentioned how a comic book series, you know, the, the, a single comic book could be 20 pages. Can somebody query with just those 20 pages or should they have the whole series full script ready? Um, if you're going to be querying a graphic novel um, as a writer, um, the, so first, the work of doing a graphic novel um, is the, the, the writing, um, a lot of writers aren't gonna be happy for me to share the secret, but uh, the writing is the thing that doesn't take the longest amount of time. Conceptually, you could spend years conceiving a graphic novel, um, but the actual scripting um, isn't as intensive as the creation of the art. Um, you know, conceptually, it, it, in, in terms of the, the act of creation, like just the, the, the creative spark of it, it is. But in terms of like actual work done, you know, an artist will sit at their drawing desk for hours and hours and hours to create a page or, a, or two pages of art. Um, and they'll have to revisit that page at different stages to finish the art. Um, but a, a writer, you know, once they go through a, a page of script, they only come back to it on edits or on revisions. Um, and then they send it off um, through the, uh, the ether to the, the writer and the editor. Um, so for, for, a writer um, who's querying an uh, agent, you want to approach them with as much material as you can. Um, if you're not going to have the full script, um, you should have a really compelling proposal. Um, and to give a, a comp that um, writers might be familiar with, prose writers might be familiar with, a graphic novel proposal is essentially the same thing as a nonfiction proposal. 
um, if you're pitching a historical work, you're going to outline the scope of what the book is covering. You know, here's all of the history that it's covering. Um, and then here's a sample chapter. Um, and that's basically what you'd be doing to write a graphic novel proposal. You also talk about your experience, you know, your platform, um, how long the book will be, all that kind of stuff. Um, that said, if you, if you have the time to write the entire thing, um, then that's great. That gives, you know, that gives the, the, the agent, um, has everything or the editor. I mean, if you send it directly to an editor, they'll have everything that they need. So do you, I mean, is it more standard to, to go the proposal way or to do the full script way? Um, with most of the writers that I work with, we're working on proposals just because they're already working on other stuff. Um, whether it's work for hire um, or, you know, their own personal projects that we've already set up. Um, in order for them to sell new work while working on something else, and, you know, for some people that something else might be working at a day job um, because it's hard to make a living as a writer. Um, having a partial manuscript, a partial script, and a proposal is enough. Um, but, you know, I really can't emphasize enough that the, the proposal has to be compelling. Um, and it has to be, it's, it's not just like a formality. It has to be fun to read. It has to be something that tells you a story in the same way that the storytelling of the story itself tell you, tells you a story. Um, so, yeah. And, and when you're looking at a script, how important is the structure? Are you, are you able to overlook if somebody maybe doesn't know the intricacies of a graphic novel structure if the story itself is good? Um, yeah, I, I'd say so. So I have, um, I've had people reach out to me who have worked in film um, in various ways, you know, writers, uh, playwrights, directors, whatever, who have never written a graphic novel script, but have a screenplay. Um, at, that they want to turn into a graphic novel. And some artists prefer to have things laid out more, but other artists kind of like the freedom of being able to play around with that and come up with their own structure for it. So it might not identify how many panels are on the page, but it'll have a number of different shots and the artist can kind of conceive how they would want it to land on the page. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's, yeah, I don't know. I, there's not really a, a set standard for it. Um, you know, I had a, a, a client and this deal hasn't been announced, so I'm not going to say his name. Um, but he's been doing a series of books on constitutional law for children. Um, and he recently, I said, Hey, you know, have you thought about doing a graphic novel? And he said, no. So I sent him a, a sample of script and he said, Oh, this looks really complicated. Can I just, can I just try and do a screenplay? And I said, sure. And so he did, and you know, we sold it and uh, paired up an artist. And that was one that we sold as a script and then paired up an artist later. So, you know, it doesn't have to be um, in a graphic novel script form. It does have to be readable. And by readable, I mean, it has to make sense. When you're reading through it, you have to have a flow of story. Um, you know, you don't have to get bogged down in description of every detail. You don't have to say this, this panel has a thousand raindrops and that one has 999. Mm -hmm. But, you know, evocative detail is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Rosemary, from the, from the illustration side, do you prefer more or less direction from your writers? Do you, do you prefer to have the freedom to sort of envision it as you want? Mm -hmm. I very much, my personal preference is, and because I've, I've worked with both, I've worked with writers who will detail, you know, they'll break down a page of action into how many panels it has to have, what has to happen in every panel. Um, and then I've worked with, again, writers like Marinko, who she, the script for Laura Dean was basically presented like a film script. So I had a, a complete, uh, sort of a richly detailed idea of what the story had to feel like, um, but it was my job and in, you know, my opinion, that's sort of like what you are hiring someone like me for is to do the job of translating that from, you know, the language that she is fluent in, which is the communication of this story as a piece of prose to the language that I'm fluent in, which is the communication of this story as a comic. So for me, getting to have sort of the, the space 
to delineate how a comic needs to flow in order to have the desired effect. Um, I mean, that's what I love about doing it. And I feel like that's, you know, the, uh, the strength, uh, the strength that your, your artist brings to the table in the collaboration. So Charlie, do you, would you encourage writers to get an artist for their project? Or is that something you'd rather do if they don't already have someone handy to just query it as a script and you can match them up? Um, I think it depends. So <laughs> it really depends on who the artist is. If it's your, if it's your cousin's friend who likes Spider-Man or something, like, I, I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to, um, you know, every piece of art that you create is valuable just in the act of its creation, but not everything is commercial. And so you might have somebody who's art you know you admire um but who isn't a good fit for a story so i would unless it's something like really compelling something that feels really fresh um oftentimes when somebody comes to me with an artist i might look at that choice and say oh i wish that i wish that this was just the script um in that case i might reach out to the writer um and say are you are you committed to this artist do you have a did you concede the story together or are you open to art suggestions? Because I don't think that we can sell this with the artist that exists on the page. Um, but you, so yeah, I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna land a well-known artist or somebody who has an incredible expressive viewpoint, then great. Um, if not, just stick to the script. Mm -hmm. And so, say you get this brand new script in your inbox, and you're really excited about it, and you think Rosemary would be a great artist for it, at what point do you take the script to her? Do you like take it and say, well, is this something you'd be interested in or do you reach out to the writer first and sort of lock them in and then move forward? Um, there's a lot of communication that goes on in pairing people up. So first I'll go to the writer and say, hey, I have some artists in mind or you know, I have one artist in mind. Um, here's the person, here's what they've worked on. How do you feel about their art? Um, they'll come back and say, yeah, you're nay. And um, at that point, then I'll say to the artist, not, you know, let me get that person to work on your book. I'll say, let me find out if that other person is available or, you know, if they are working on something else, when they'll be available to work on your book. Mm -hmm. Um, then I'll reach out to the artist and find out what their schedule is like. And sometimes they might love the artist that I brought them, but the artist can't start working on it for another year and a half. And they might say, well, I really want to do something with it now. And then you say, well, let's work together in the future. It was great to meet you. Um, and then you move on to the next artist on the list. Mm -hmm. um, I generally don't like to do, I'll, I'll typically just approach like an artist at a time. Um, I don't like to, to do a, a bake off, so to speak, um, for somebody to get the art. Unless they're, if you're going to have a bunch of artists trying out for a gig, the writer should pay them for that work. If you're working with one person, I think you're both in both the writer and, and the artist are both investing time and effort into the project equally. Um, and so you could work on spec. Mm -hmm. So la last question here before we switch gears again, uh, it, it's going to be a, a I, I don't expect a cut and dry answer, but I want to hear what your take on this is Charlie, when it comes to s actually selling a graphic novel, do you think that the art is more important? I understand it's a collaboration process, but people see the art first. So do you feel like that's a bigger selling point than the writing? Um, well, when it comes to selling a graphic novel, there are a couple things that I do. One is I, I write a compelling pitch. Um, but my, my latest kind of strategy um, for selling books is, is not just, you know, not just writing a, a pitch that makes somebody excited about it and want to read it, but also um, including a sample of the art in that letter um, that I sent out to, to editors. Um, you know, for ones that I have a really good relationship, I'll call them up and um, tell them it's the best book that I've ever read um, before I send over the letter. For editors that I'm not as close with, um, I'll call them um, to follow up to make sure that they've, that they've seen my, uh, my query letter. Um, as far as what sells it more, I think if you're, if you're thinking of a, gra I, I'm, I feel so like, anxious about answering this question because like no matter what I say artists and writers are going to be angry um 
but if you're in a if you're in a bookstore walking around the graphic novel section, um, you might see a name that'll pull you over on the spine of a book. But if you don't know any names, what's going to pull you in first is art. You're going to look at that cover and you're going to say that looks interesting. Um, sometimes you might look at the cover and see the title and say that looks interesting. Um, but I think typically what's pulling you in is the art. And then what makes you stay there is how the art and the words work together. Um, you know, the character work is one part the writer and one part the artist. The expressiveness of the characters, um, the dialogue, just the conception of how the, the story moves along, it really is a marriage of the two. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's hard to say what, what makes um, people excited about a project, but I, I think, and you hear this a lot in, with prose um, agents and editors, um, voice, except the voice is coming from two people. <laughs> it's a chorus <laughs> yeah I mean I think you are touching on something that I find foundational to comics which is that like once they are sort of welded the words are, like they're not separate they're not disparate elements like the experience of the story is the concert of the two of them so I agree with you that you know covers and important we all know cover is very important um and there's sort of an immediacy to the visuals but yeah it's the the link between the the words and the pictures is not i think as clear it's not as easily separatable as people think it is and, and that actually transitions really well into the next segment that i want to talk to primarily you rosemary about sort of the artist's mind and and, and approach to storytelling um, I, I have a writer's mind. I believe that I can tell an entire story with words just fine. But for graphic novels, you kind of have to, it is like, like we've been saying, it is a collaboration process. So for you, when you conceptualize a story, I guess, first off, do you, con you write, you, you do your own original work as well. So when you conceptualize a story, does it come first to you as an image or as a as sort of like a, a visual thing? Um, I mean, I, I think this does touch exactly on what I was saying, where I, you know, comics is sort of my chosen medium because I find it to be the richest way to tell a story, like the most sort of ripe in possibilities. Um, I think the potential of what you're able to communicate and how you're able to communicate it is infinite. Um, and so the way that I think of stories has been for, for a while now, uh, again, not sort of a not a gray area between image and word um just because that's what i that's what i work in is that gray area between image and word like that's you know where the stories that i tell happen to exist um and so i i don't really know if it's possible for me to think of one without the other i mean i, I do both you know i i am an illustrator and a writer as well as a graphic novelist so i sort of like in the separates as well as the the unit um but I don't know it's it's for me it's always been kind of like well why would I you know like the, the sum of the the parts of the two in my mind is so great and is so much uh so much more exciting than than either of them as individual things that why would I want to separate them once I know what they can do together you know mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense and I guess the other angle of it that I find so fascinating is whenever you are given a script, at what point does that script also become your story? Like, is it something where you read it right away and you fall in love and you're like, this is mine now too? Or do you have to start drawing and seeing it come to life and then it becomes mm -hmm. your story also? I mean, with Laura Dean, for the first, for like the, I read the script and then I had to, you know, thumbnail out the whole book essentially. Um, and during that, it still felt like, well, I'm... I'm adding my voice to Mariko's vision, you know, but throughout the lifespan of working on the book, which was, you know, two years total, which is not an insignificant amount of time to be on one project, um, it shifted uh, completely. And I think there's a part of that that's like, you know, I got to design these characters. I got to, I was like the architect of what they looked like, how they moved through the world, what their worlds looked like, how they looked at each other. Like all of that came uh, from, from me and was sort of executed by my hand and I think it's very hard not to sort of like feel uh, yourself getting intertwined with the story um, you know and feel like it's parent when you're spending a so much time with the project um, and b when so many so many things that are integral to what that book is came from me you know like it's that that 
the, the collaboration uh, element of it kind of happens there. Mm -hmm. and, and I was I was actually taking a graphic novel class where they talked about how the action of a graphic novel happens in between the panels. So I'm mm -hmm. curious, from an artistic standpoint, how do you choose what the panel is and what you leave to be imagined in between those panels? I mean, that's a huge, that's a very big question because I feel like that's the that's what I consider to be the work of comics, you know, is sort of the the choice of what to present, what not to present, how to present it. Um, time and its passage are sort of what happens in that space. Um, I think one of the fantastic things about comics is depending on your paneling, you know, one page can be a hundred years or it can be a half of a second. I, I mean, I, I think that that's sort of a one of the uh, yeah one of the things that I personally uh, find the most exciting about the medium and one of the uh, I'm struggling to think of the right words but um I don't know I it's what I in the same way that sort of uh, the problem solving inherent in editorial illustration maybe is sort of like how do I communicate this specific idea through this one image or as a prose writer, you're like, how do I, I have a vision for what this space looks like, for what these characters are like, how do I communicate that? I think that the like inherent problem that you're solving in comics is like, how do I lay out the sequence of images on this page so that it has the desired effect? So the work of comics, the like what I consider to be sort of the real labor of it is in those paneling decisions um, and is in the sort of, uh, you know, the design of a page as like a, an aesthetic piece, but also as a, just a, an act of expression or an act of communication. Mm -hmm. and, and kind of riffing off that, because you've also, you've done these, like Laura Dean keeps breaking up with me, those, but you've also worked on ongoing series like Steven Universe, Gotham Academy. How do you go about matching your artistic vision to a series that's already in motion, that already has sort of an artistic vision going do you sort of try to acclimate to that or just create a new brand for it for the ones that you're illustrating? Um, I mean, I think it's a, a tightrope walk between sort of knowing that you have been asked to collaborate on a project because of what you do, um, whatever your particular creative voice or vision or style is, um, but also, you know, understanding that like you are doing a job in those cases and you do have sort of a, a a, a larger uh, boss or structure to kind of, I don't know, make your voice fit into. Um, so with those, it, it's sort of a, the problem solving element becomes a different thing. It's sort of like, how do I marry what I'm naturally inclined to do with, um, with what I'm being asked to do? So it's about sort of like finding the, the moments or the, I don't know, character traits or paneling decisions that are exciting to you within this sort of pre-existing structure or world. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you for the answer. Like I said, as a writer's mind, I know a lot of our audience is also writer predominant. It's nice to be able to see into the artist's mind and how you approach these projects as well. So thank you for the clarity in those answers. Um, thank you. Wanna switch over, Charlie, it feels like more than any other style of writing, graphic novels are built for series. So should aspiring graphic novelists build a series or should they just start with one? Is a standalone okay also? Um, I, I think a standalone is, approaching it as a standalone is best. Um, whether you have a series or you're just selling a standalone, um, you're selling to publishers the, way, the same way that you're selling to readers. You're giving them characters in a compelling story that'll um, encourage them to want to stick around and see what happens next. Mm -hmm. um, you have to do a satisfying book. I know that um, I'm about to talk about Harry Potter because um, I enjoyed Harry Potter. I know that um, JK has been um, in the news for some awful things lately, but that first Harry Potter book could have just stood on its own if she hadn't sold anything else if she hadn't had any other designs for where Harry might go. You know, this boy finds out he's a wizard. He finds out what happened to his parents. Um, he learns magic. He makes friends. Um, and he fights off the return of an evil wizard. The end. Like, it could have ended there and been satisfying for readers. Um, the fact that it was a series is part of what made it so delightful because it, it followed a very prescriptive kind of format. But each book 
in its own way was satisfying. I think up until probably the Goblet of Fire where it started to give a glimpse of a bigger story. Um, and at that point it became more like a traditional kind of series. You know, it went from being like a middle grade interlinked series to a narratively complex, more like YA style, um, lo long format storytelling. So I think if you're gonna be pitching a graphic novel that you have conceived as a series, you really need to make the first book satisfying on its own. And then, you know, you don't have to show your entire hand and say, I have the series plotted out to eight books. Maybe instead focus on making one really, really good book. And if it does well, if it's well received, then focus, then, you know, move on to the next book um, in the series. And if you have one really good book, an editor is going to look at that and say, oh my God, there's so much potential here for a series. And they might offer you two books or three books um, in a book contract or want to talk about what your other ideas are um, while it's on submission. So, you know, having a, having a, a plan for it is good. Um, trying to sell it all at once is not because you might just be disappointed. Mm -hmm. um, or you might be focusing too much on the, the long game and not enough on what's actually being sold, which is the first book. So, Rosemary, do, do you ever see a plain non-illustrated book out there and think that you could illustrate it, that you could do a graphic novel version of it? And does that ever happen? Um, I mean, I, you know, there's, I think, a little part of me every time I read a book that I really like that does a book that's evocative enough that I'm sort of, that it makes me think visually. There is a little part of me that's like, oh, this would be fun. I could do this here. I could do this here. It's it's mostly just a, uh, mostly just a, you know, sort of an interesting mental exercise, though, because I feel like, you know, if I'm reading a prose book, then that book, sure, there's room for adaptation, but that book already kind of exists as the perfect version of itself, which was the medium that it was, you know, intended to be in, the medium it exists in. Um, so it's usually more of just like a, what could I do here? What could I, like, it would be fun to play in the sandbox, you know? And Charlie, I know sometimes I feel like books are reincarnated as graphic novels. Is, is that something you facilitate? S similar question. Do you see books out there that you want to see in a graphic novel? And can that happen? Yeah, I mean, I have worked on some graphic adaptations. And I think, I think the thing about a graphic adaptation is it just can't be by rote. It's really got to justify its existence. Um, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. there, there, ha there are graphic adaptations where you, you can tell the publishers, publisher is just thinking, oh, comics sell well, the kids love graphic novels, let's do one. Um, and those maybe do well because they have a fan base who want to check it out, but the ones that I think do the best are the ones that there's a reason for it to be graphic. Um, you know, like with um, The Adventure Zone, the series that I have going um, with First Second, um, that really lends itself well to a graphic novel. And Carrie, um, Carrie Peach is an incredible artist and add so much visual detail into each panel and so many, you know, background goofs and stuff that somebody reading that book is getting a condensed version of, I mean, each campaign could be 15 hours of podcast con condensed into 200 pages. Um, it's really distilled down to its, its best elements. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, not, not its best elements, but it's, it's most basic elements. Um, it's streamlined, you know, they're taking all of the, uh, all of the, the things that might lower its, its um, wind resistance off. So it just streamlines mm -hmm. and flows. All right. So, so go ahead. Oh, no, no, sorry. I thought I was going to say something and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we're going to cut to our last question before going into the audience questions. Uh, recommendations. Uh, if you could recommend for an aspiring graphic novelist, what's a great place to start to sort of better acclimate yourself with this genre as a whole? And this is, you can plug your own book as well. If you feel like one of yours does that, by all means, throw it in there. Uh, let's start with Rosemary on this one. Um, well, I'm just going to plug some of my favorite. I mean, I about comics forever, but the last let me see, I'll do three. Uh, the last three books that really left an impact on me and left an impact on me in a way that a prose book could never have, um, like just that the, they sort of like were able to hit that incision, um, that comics is so, you know, sort of uniquely equipped to do, were Skip by Molly Mendoza, 
Um, it's a like a visual feast. It's it's sumptuous. It's stunning. Um, Gleam by Freddie Carrasco. Uh, similar similarly like just a if you want to talk about like the storytelling work that paneling does, I think both of those are incredible examples. Uh, and then also a book that's been out for a while. Um, my I, my mentor in college, Caitlin Skalrud, um, put out a book called Houses of the Holy. Um, and I just think she is one of the best writers uh, working currently. And I do think she, her particular blend uh, of image and prose is done in a way that I think is, unique and particularly compelling. So those would be my top three. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie, any recommendations from you? Um, yeah, so I mean, I would say that you should start off um, reading Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud, especially if you're an aspiring comic storyteller. That's that's kind of the Bible of understanding how comics are told, you know, what the, the different panel, um, lines mean, you know, how time works in a comic book. Like, it's all laid out very concisely and clearly. Um, that book was was just incredible. Um, in terms of what I'm reading right now, um, so my client, Kyle Latino, just had a book come out called The Savage Beard of She-Dwarf um, that I'm very excited about. Um, I It's about a, a, a little dwarf who, she dwarf, who um, thinks that she's the last dwarf on earth, or on, I don't even know if it's on earth, it's, it's whatever the planet is. And so she goes out in search of her people and she, um, she re she's really good at fighting and she's really good at taking baths. Um, and it has beard wrestling, it has everything you could possibly want. It has a, a hawk like war god who wears a speedo and stiletto boots, it's like, a hawk-headed war god. It's it's just a visual, a visual treat um, that riffs and I think corrects some um, some fantasy tropes um, in a in a really progressive sort of way. Um, just pure fun. Um, and then I also am really into this web comic called Heart of Gold um, by Viv Tanner and Eli Baumgarten. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, do you, you know that one? I do, I do. That's a good recommendation. Yeah, it's just beautifully, mm -hmm. um, sumptuously composed. It's got this painterly style, and the way that uh, they use light is just stunning. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really enjoying that. And then I'm also reading um, Thunder Agents Archives, which Clint McElroy sent to me. It's an old DC title, um, and it's it's lots of pow, bam, explodey kind of action stuff. Um, I'm about halfway through it, so jury's still out, but enjoying it so far. <laughs> it's a callback to the 70s and 80s. Thank you for your recommendations. And I want to actually recommend Bitter Roots. It's a tremendous, it's from Image Comics. It's what I'm reading right now, and it's incredible, mm -hmm. and it's timely, and it's just, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful story. Um, all right, so I want to jump into audience questions now. Uh, Charlie, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to combine two questions here. So, if you are the writer and the artist, at what point should you query and how much art do you need to see from that prospective person? Um, if you're the writer, if you're a cartoonist, I would say um, I would want five to 10 pages. I, I say that because you're probably not gonna be showing me script. Um, I imagine if you're, if you're the writer and the artist, you'll just be showing me finished pages. Um, I think that five to 10 pages is good. You know, with somebody who has a, a track record, um, let's say you've been published before, you have a good sales track or um, a successful Kickstarter or something, um, you, can, you can submit with less. Um, any other kind of things that you can put into the proposal, um, you know, going back to the proposal as a sales tool, any visual information you can put into the proposal is great. Character sketches, you know, whether you're showing like, um, different assets, uh, different di aspects of your character's uh, personalities in those sketches, like maybe some expressions on their face, um, drawing a cover for it. If you have an idea for the cover, why not draw the cover now? It makes a nice cover page and it, it makes it look more professional and, and it really can just pull somebody in. In the same way that when you're walking through a bookstore, you go, what's that? And you see a really stunning cover. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Rosemary, 
as an illustrator, do you ever hear about a project that you want to work on? And is that something that like you can, how do you go about doing that? If it is, if it is something that you hear about and you want to work on it? Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, I don't know if I've had necessarily that experience personally, but I've, I've definitely sort of sent emails um, or contacted either writers or artists or people whose sort of like creative vision I find compatible with my own or whose work excites me just to sort of like start a line of dialogue and be like, hey, this is like, this is who I am. I love what you do. I love what you're presenting. Like, I would love to just, you know, it can be just kind of a, a meeting of the minds type thing. Or, I mean, I think people love to hear uh, from folks who have found something interesting or something exciting about their work. Um, I think if there's someone out there who's doing work that you really like and you'd like to work with them, it never hurts to just get in touch. Um, the worst thing they can say is no. Um, but, you know, it's always, we're all just people trying to tell stories. And so if you find something worthwhile in their work, chances are they might in yours too. Mm -hmm. And Charlie, this one's for you. Is there a recommended story length for a graphic novel? Is there a such thing as short sto flash stories in, com in graphic novels or are they all kind of around the same general pages? Uh, so in France, they, they do BDs. They do Ben Dessine, um, which are like 40, 45 page comics um, that are bound up in little graphic novels, very slim volumes. That's not something that's typically done in the US. Um, so if you're looking at pitching a comic book um, series, you're generally looking at, for a, for a mini series, four to five issues of about 20 to 24 pages each. Um, so that puts you at a little bit over 100, you know, 100 to a little bit over 100 for that, if that's your objective. If you're looking to pitch a graphic novel to a trade publisher, um, most of them generally like you to start at 200 pages. It gives you a fat enough spine that when you put it on the shelf, you can actually read what's there. You can look, I mean, just looking at your shelf behind you, if you look at those Star Wars books, the fatter spines you can read, the thinner ones, which you know are individual arcs of comic book series, um, are harder to read. Um, it gives you more real estate in the in the bookstore, and so they they prefer that. I also think when they're pricing it at you know anywhere from eighteen to twenty bucks. Um, that there's a perceived value the reader is getting. Um, you know, they're getting double the amount of pages that they would with a, a, a comic book bound up into a trade volume, um, and they're paying double. If they're, if they're getting 150 pages, that value proposition might not be as, it, it might not be there for them. Mm -hmm. So last question, and this is for both of you. Uh, if you could give one piece of advice to aspiring comic book, graphic novel, cartoon writers out there, what would that piece of advice be? So let's start with Rosemary on this one. I think if you are going to dedicate any portion of your life to comics, uh, to drawing them, to making them, you have to love them so much and have a, a level of sort of respect and understanding for what is special about them. Um, I think if you are going to make someone else, uh, you know, care about your work as much as you care about it, like really try to hone in on sort of what what is both unique to what you bring to the table as a creative voice and what does your chosen medium do to amplify that. And Charlie, advice from you? Uh, read constantly. Be mm -hmm. omnivorous. Read all different types of books. Um, inspiration can come anywhere. Um, and when you're entering the business as a writer and an artist, you're entering the cultural conversation. You can't be part of, a, of the current conversation if all of your references are from 40 years ago or older. Um, you know, if your favorite book is The Great Gatsby and you wanna pitch literary fiction um, and you just keep comparing it to The Great Gatsby, editors are gonna think there's something wrong with you because you're not participating <laughs> in the current cultural conversation. You don't know what's being published or how books have changed. And um, I think that's important. When I wanna unplug, I'm not typically reading a lot of comics now. I'm reading literary fiction or nonfiction or poetry um, just because it kind of re it, um, is a palate cleanser mm -hmm. for when I go back to comics. Um, so just read all that you can. 
Thank you both. All right. This is where I say goodbye to both of you before I wrap up the show. So thank you both so much for your insight and for being here. Thank you so much. Of course. So much fun. Um, can I just mention one thing before yes. we go? Rosemary, I see a piece of art hanging on your wall there. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, Dreaming of the Second Impact by Rebecca Mock. Yes, it is. And Great so when eye. you were, yeah, when you were talking, I have that hanging in my office. Um, when you were talking about kind of inhabiting things that you're watching and kind of imbuing it with your own storytelling, I think that's a really excellent, um, a really excellent embodiment of that because it's oh, a, yeah. it's a very quiet scene, but it, it really communicates a lot. About yeah, Rebecca story. Mock is a master. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So anyway, sorry. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you both. Thank Thanks. you so much. Absolutely. See you later. Thank Bye. you. All right. So for those of you who want to get involved, I'm going to tell you about the Twitter pitch party. So if you've been here before, you know the drill. But if you have a graphic novel, cartoon, comic book series of your own that you want to pitch, we're doing it again on, on Twitter. Uh, if you include the hashtag Pit Gotham, you can pitch your uh, series or standalone, and I will send the pitches on to Charlie for feedback. So a couple uh, tips and tricks, guidelines to follow. Make sure you condense your book into a single tweet. Multiple tweet pitches are not allowed. If you have more than one idea, though, you can pitch them as many as you want, as long as they're in separate tweets. Also, since this is graphic novels, feel free to include an artwork or, or a collage or whatever. If you think that's going to uh, contribute to your, to your pitch, then definitely include that if you're the artist as well. Also, a good idea to have comparable titles. Just really easy to sort of center the agent's mind on what it is you're pitching them. Uh, tip here, focus on what makes your book unique. You see that's the protagonist and the main drive of the plot. And then make sure you end with a hook, something to entice the agent and, want, and leave them wanting more. Lastly, and most importantly, make sure you include the hashtag Pit Gotham. If you do not include that, I can't find your pitch. So make sure that you include that pitch. You don't have to tag anybody. As long as you include that hashtag, I will find it. You have until Friday at midnight, um, and, and feedback usually comes within a couple weeks or so. Lastly, as I mentioned at the top of the show, the Gotham Writers Conference is going this uh, October 16th, 17th, and 18th. It's going to be on Zoom, but it's going to be the same structure as last year. If you have a project to pitch uh, throughout all the genres, you'll have two top agents in your field at a table with you. You'll be spending four and a half hours with them. So plenty of time to get some to build a rapport with these agents as well as pitching your project. Um, and, and of course, panels and presentations as well throughout the first two days. So that's it for today. Coming up next week, Wednesday, same time, we're going to be talking about commercial fiction. Uh, so we'll hope to see you then. And thank you all for being here.